Well, good morning. Again, if this is your first time at uh, Living Word Church, we are so grateful that you're here. Uh, we know you could be anywhere. Uh, you could be at home in the bed. Uh, had plenty of reasons to stay there. There's possible snow coming, uh, up to an inch of snow, I'm told. And so, uh, you know, hoard your bread and milk and pour it on the driveway, Ray, so you can get out and, uh, you know, whatever you need to do to protect your family from this inch of snow that could possibly be coming. But uh, like Donna said, some of us had a late night. Last night we went to Winter Jam down at the Georgia Dome, and uh, it was really good. I'll be honest with you, I don't like going to Atlanta. I honestly despise driving down to Atlanta, but it wasn't too bad of a drive. And uh, Donna and I left uh, a little bit early. We left after Crowder played, and... uh, uh, it was just a night, an amazing night to be in amongst about 40-something thousand people just worshiping Jesus. Uh, it's awesome. But you know what? It's just as awesome to worship Jesus in a crowd like this. You know, it's just as awesome when three or four of us get together and we get serious about praying to him. The same God that showed up at the Georgia Dome shows up in that little circle. It's not like he's a greater God because more people show up. It's just that more people with Jesus on their mind as the first thing, it's like a more tangible thing in a way, but he's not any greater there than he is this morning. And so what I want to encourage you with is that the God that created the universe, that brought people back from the dead, that healed people with blindness and leprosy and grew legs and made people that couldn't walk to walk, is here this morning. And he can do for you everything he's ever done and more. Now, we think we like to limit God sometimes and think, you know, God doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't heal people anymore. God doesn't bring people back from the dead anymore. You know what? God is not some tired old man. He is fully able to do anything he wants to do this morning. And so much of it depends on our willingness to surrender to him all that we have. Because when we decide we're going to give him everything, oh, but there's this one thing. I kind of want to hang on to that. Then you tie God's hands. The God of the universe that has all power, you can stop him from working a miracle in your own life by not surrendering everything to him. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning. We're starting a new series this morning about marriage. Um, But I want to encourage you guys that are not married, this is going to be just as helpful for you. I'm, I'm excited for our students to hear what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks because honestly, you can listen to this and if you'll listen to it with a mindset of, of you know, I want to learn some things so that when the day comes that I start thinking about getting married, I don't have to make the mistakes that all those old people made. Right? Could I get some amens for that from you old people that have made mistakes? Come on. Uh, let's help them out a little bit because I'm telling you, we have, and I'll just tell you from, from our perspective, mine and Donna's perspective, we've made pretty much every mistake in marriage you could make. Honestly, almost, almost every mistake in marriage we have pretty much made. We, we are blessed that God, for some strange reason, decided many years ago to start using us to help coach uh, couples in marriage. We, do, we still wonder why sometimes, but God healed our marriage, and, and I believe we have the best marriage of anybody I know. That doesn't mean you don't have a better marriage than us. I'm just saying I don't know it. I don't know anybody that has one better than us, but it wasn't always that way. Matter of fact, marriage is... One of those things that I believe is the greatest thing in your life, really, I truly believe that, or it's the worst thing in your life, one or the other. There's not a whole lot of middle ground with that. And at one time, our marriage was the worst thing in our lives because we didn't do it God's way. We did it our way. And so the title of this series is What's So Great About Marriage? Well, I just got to be up front with you and tell you, you know, a lot of preachers will, will take uh, messages from other preachers that they hear online or on TV or whatever, and they'll, they'd like, you know, it's a good message that you hear from whoever you like, and they'll basically borrow that message and just regurgitate it to a crowd and make people think it's their own message, you know, and everybody goes, wow, that was great. I've never heard that before. But if you go online, you'll hear it from somebody else. Well, I just want to tell you up front, this is not an original message. I'm taking this material for the most part, it, well, I'll share some of our own stuff, from uh, Marriage Today. You can look them up online. You can watch them on TV, Jimmy and Karen Evans. 
Uh, it, it's a ministry that God used in our lives many, many years ago um, when we had gotten counseling and our marriage was getting much better. God used it almost to kind of polish us in a way. Our marriage was better, but it wasn't as good as it needed to be. And God used this material to polish our marriage to make it even better than what it was. So when we do our marriage coaching, we use their material. And so uh, folks that have gone through coaching with us will hear some of the same things I'm going to share with you. So I just want to make that up front. Uh, if you go online and watch them, you may hear some of the things I share with you through this week. So I can't take a lot of credit, but the, the fact is it comes from God's Word. You know, the truth is, if we do marriage God's way, it works 100% of the time. Isn't that good news? You know, you think, I've I, I got to go through all this junk in my marriage. You know, you have the honeymoon, and then it's downhill, and it's just, I'm settled with this marriage for the rest of my life, and I just got to endure somehow. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is that we get better and better and better at everything that we do. And what else do you do that the longer you do it, you don't get better at it? Nothing. Everything you do, the longer you do it, you get better at it. I'm a better pastor than I used to be. And some of you are saying, thank God, how bad could you have been? But you on your job, you are better at your job the longer you do it. True? It makes sense in a, in a secular way we think about that. You know, I've been doing my job for 30 years. I'm really good at it. I don't need any instruction. Well, that's the way marriage should be. Not that you don't need instruction, but we should get better and better and better. Three points excuse me, I want to make before I get started, focus on yourself. It'll be really easy for you to look around or do this or that or go, mm -hmm. yeah, you hear what he said? Don't do that. Focus on the one inside. Focus on yourself or what God would want you to change. Okay? Let's, let's just have a little practice here. Looking straight ahead. Looking straight ahead. Not doing this or that. Looking straight ahead. Focus on yourself. Because I see y'all already. Y'all are already doing it. <laughs> Focus on yourself. Don't listen for your spouse. Listen for yourself. It'll be really easy to say when you go home. Do you hear what Mark said about men? Do you hear what he said about women and how, we should, how you should treat your husbands? Don't do that. And marriage works 100% of the time when we do it God's way. So today I'm going to share with you four laws. Four laws. Of marriage, And the first law is the law of priority. The law of priority. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We all know that scripture. We understand that. Exodus 20 verse 5 says, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And Exodus 34 14 says, For you shall not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now what these scriptures tell us is that when you get married, an amazing thing happens that you leave your family, hopefully, <laughs> geographically, but at least your heart leaves from your family and is joined to your spouse's heart, okay? That suddenly, it doesn't mean you hate your family, but instead of your family being the priority, your spouse is now the priority, However, in Exodus, God says, I'm a jealous God. He says, don't worship any other gods. We know that because I'm a jealous God. And he goes on in verse uh, 14 of chapter 34. He says, my name is jealous. One of the names of God is jealous with a capital J. He's our redeemer, right? He's our healer. He's our savior. He's our Lord. He's... He's all these different names, but one of his names is jealous. Now, when we think of jealousy, we think of a bad jealousy. We think, you know, my wife is jealous of other women, or my husband is jealous of other men, or whatever it may be. You know, I don't like the way he looks at her. I don't like the way she looks at him or, or talked to him. And, you know, he shouldn't have touched her or whatever. And we have that kind of jealousy. Well, that's put in you by God. And we think of jealousy as all negative, but God says, my name is jealous. That means don't put anything before me, is what God says. And God really means that. He truly means don't put anything before him, even your spouse. Now, I've got to tell you, I know where this hits with some of you. It, it's hard, and, and you may want to push back a little bit. And you might think, well, wait a minute. You know, 
Mark, you, what you don't know is I have small children. And they need me. They do need you. Absolutely. They need you to take care of them. You may have babies. We have grandbabies that are still very young that can't walk and, and can't, you know, they can't cook and wash their own clothes. Obviously, you have to do those things for your children. But listen, you've got to understand something. God is God. It's that simple. He is God. I'm not. Your spouse is not. Your children is not. This church is not God. Church is not God. Church is a place where we come to worship Him and hopefully get equipped to, to share Him with the community outside. But church is not God. Your pastor obviously is not God. Where, wherever, if you're just visiting here, wherever you go to church, pastors are not God. They're just men or women that, that are just doing the best they can. God alone is God, and He's the only one that's worthy of our worship and all of our lives. And He says, I'm jealous, I'm so jealous that I'll come against anything that you put before me. The word jealousy here basically means intolerant of rivalry. God is intolerant of rivalry. Anything that you put in his place, a spouse, a child, a job, a church, a ministry, a car, a hobby, whatever it may be, God instantly comes against that thing. Let me, let me share it with you in, in the context of marriage. When you get married, when you stand in an altar, God puts this, even maybe before that, God puts this thing in you that when your spouse puts something above you, you don't like it, do you? Let me share you our, our story. Many years ago when Donna and I got married, um, golf was like the greatest thing in my life. Golf and softball, I've shared this before. I loved golf, um, loved playing softball. I was pretty good at it. I was decent at golf, better at softball. But I loved playing golf, and I loved playing softball. And I played golf, honestly, two or three days a week. Um, I would go play golf on the weekends, you know, and in the afternoons. And then when I'd get home from playing 18 holes of golf, I would get out in the yard and start working on the stuff I had messed up while I was out playing golf, you know. And it caused huge problems in our marriage, huge problems in our marriage even to the point that we have just constantly argued. And Donna said, I'm not that valuable to you. you don't, I'm not first in your life. And I would tell her, no, you are first in my life. I love you more than anything. But my actions proved that golf was more important to me. Listen, you, and I, I get the silence. I understand where this lands. We've lived it. God, Donna didn't hate golf. Honestly, at one point, she thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take... She went and took golf lessons. I mean, what kind of wife does that? She went and took lessons to play golf and tried to play golf with me. And, and if you know Donna, she's very uh, um, passionate, and it, I'm working on it, and excited about things, you know, whatever it may be, and wants things she wants to do well, and she wants to do things that, that are, you know, do it with excellence. And if you've ever played golf, you know... You can't play golf with excellence. You just can't. I don't care who you are. Tiger Woods has proven that. You know, you can't always play golf with excellence. And so when you play golf and, and you don't do so great, sometimes things come out that shouldn't come out. And so Donna decided, as much as I love you and want to be with you for my spiritual life, I cannot play golf. But she tried. She never hated golf. She hated the fact that it took me away from her and that my attention was devoted to golf. No matter what I said, it was devoted to golf and getting better. You know, you have to, the thing about priority is you have to protect yourself from even good things out of priority. Golf wasn't a bad thing. Softball wasn't a bad thing. It's just that it had been the priority of my life. There were times in our life when we put our children before each other. You know, not, and I'm not talking about when they were babies. I'm saying when they were 10, 12, you know, teenagers. And it's good. Listen, parents, I'm not trying to say don't take care of your kids and don't do stuff with them. We did everything with our kids. I, I, we were telling our daughter about it this week. And we play, we, we, all of our kids played sports. I coached all of their teams at one time. Believe it or not, we had three kids playing baseball and softball. 
And I coached all three of them at one time. It was insanity. Even Ashley was saying, I can't, I remember we lived at the park. She said, I can't remember how many nights I did homework sitting in the car at the park while one of the other, the boys or whatever, was playing ball. And it was just insanity. And I, and I don't regret it. I'll be honest with you. I'm so thankful I did that with them because they remember the time that I spent with them. But you have to be careful that you don't put anything above God. Not even your spouse. And I will prove this to you. But you have to be careful that even those good things, spending time with your kids, spending time with your spouse, doing things each other, doesn't take priority over God. Because if I put, even now, if I put her above God, God's going to come against that. He doesn't want to destroy our marriage. He's just going to come against that. He, he's going to come against it in a way that gets our attention to go, listen, you've lost your priority. You know, in Revelation, God's talking to the church. And what does he say to the church? He says, you have lost your first love. Remember from the heights you have fallen and come back. Come back. That's what often I think we've done. We've made church God instead of God God. And God is the only one that's God. And in marriage, we have to make sure before anything else, we've got to settle this, that God alone is first in our lives, in my life and in your spouse's life. And I'm going to tell you, the one thing that changed our marriage, that really propelled our marriage to healing, was when I decided God's going to be first in my life above her. When she decided, God, my relationship with Jesus Christ is going to be first above you, Mark. And at that moment, you, you could almost see a light switch go on that our marriage began to change and get better and better. I want to share with you Four ways that you can protect your marriage and show priority in real terms, not in just words. First is sacrifice. Sacrifice says, what will you give up for me? What will you give up for me? For many years, I've quit playing golf. I actually gave my clubs to a friend of mine that had started playing golf. Again, not because she hated golf and wanted me to never play again. It's just I needed to do that. I, I needed to do that to prove not just to her, but to myself that I could live without golf. You know, that I, I really was going to put God first and then she was going to be next. And, and it was just something that I needed to do. I'm not saying you have to do that. But you need to say, you need to prove, what will you give up for me? And I promise you, you know what it is, don't you? You might not want to talk about it. It might cause an argument when you talk about it. But you know what you need to give up for your spouse to prove to them that they are priority. And I want to say this to you too. Whatever you won't give up for them is your priority. Outside of God, outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ, if there's something in your mind that you'd say, I won't give that up for them, I won't do it, then you've just made a decision that that thing is your highest priority. Okay? Next is time. You give the first of your time to your spouse, except for God. God should get the first of your time. He should get your best time. Uh, Donna is an amazing lady, as many of you know. She gives God the first part of her day every day. I'm able to now. And honestly, and you're like, what does that mean, you're able to now? You didn't used to? It's different. When you work a job where you have to get up at, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever time it is and drive a long way or whatever it is, it's really hard. I, I'm just acknowledging that. It's really hard to get up an hour early and read your Bible and pray and then get ready for work and then drive to work. I, I, I've been there. But what I used to do when I was driving 35 minutes to work, I would get up, get ready, and I would listen to the Word all the way to work and pray while I'm driving. And there, so there's no excuse anymore. You can get the Bible on an iPod. You can get CDs. I mean, you know, podcasts, whatever. There's no excuse anymore. And so in that way, I felt like, and maybe I'm justifying it, I don't know, but I felt like at least at that point, I was giving God the first part of my day to the best of my ability. But Donna's one, one of those that's always gotten up first thing, cup of coffee comes first because, you know, we want to live. And then after the cup of coffee, then it's the word and prayer for the first part of the day. And we're able to do that together now, thankful to, to you guys and to the Lord. Next thing is energy. You need to have energetic time together. Not just, you know, 
at the end of your day and you're just like, you know, oh, I'm so tired, but we're together, uh, you know, watching TV and vegging out and just, you know, and, we, and it's not that you can't watch TV or veg out. We'll probably do that this afternoon, especially after last night. But, you know, energetic time, maybe walk together, maybe spend some time praying together. Maybe, maybe you can, you know, I don't know what you can do, but there's things that you can do together. Think back to when you used to date, you know, things that you can do together, but it needs to be energetic time together. And then the fourth way is attitude. You spend time together because you want to, not because you have to. And I'll be honest with you, when we started really trying to do this, we were both bad, but I have to admit, I was the worst, and I always am. But, you know, there would be times when I just had a really crappy attitude about us spending time together. Donna would want us to spend time together, just us, not the kids, not TV, not anything else. And it was just like I had this awful attitude. It's like, okay, I'm here, you know. And she's like, you might as well just go on and do what you were doing because this is not helping at all, you know. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Looking straight ahead, looking straight ahead, no, none of this. You know what I'm talking about. We, we do that, don't we? But listen, these are the four ways that you can prove that your spouse has priority. And honestly, it's four ways that you can prove that God has priority as well. You know, what will you give up for God? What would you give up for your spouse? What time are you giving with God? And is it energetic time? And do you have a great attitude when you're spending time with God? I promise you, when you do these four things with God and with your spouse, you will be a better person. You will be the one that's blessed. Not just them, yes, them, but you will be the one that comes away going, I'm so get glad that I have changed this in my life. The next law of uh, marriage is the law of pursuit. The law of pursuit. Again, Genesis chapter 2, 24 says, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word cling in this translation means to follow zealously. To follow zealously. Basically all it means is that marriage is work. Marriage is work. This is not anything new to you guys, but it's something that you have to do every single day. And I, and I shared, and, I, and I, don't, I don't mean to sound arrogant. If you guys know me, I, I don't mean to sound that way. But we really do, I feel like, have a great marriage. But it's because we have to work at it every single day. And if we go a few days without working at our marriage and, and doing the things that we've learned that we need to do, our marriage suffers. It'll suffer today. If, if for some reason I start putting this church or you, you guys or, or other things before Donna, our marriage will suffer. And, and it's easy to do, right? You guys, you guys know that. It's easy to put other things first because it's important, right? Things are important. A job's important. You know, kids are important. You have to do those things. But if you get them out of priority, then you, you mess up what has been going on. And even today, if I don't put John, Donna first, and if I don't pursue her, it's going to harm our marriage. What does that mean, the law of pursuit? It says, the man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. You have to make a, a conscious effort to prove to your spouse that I still want you. I still desire you. I still love you. I want to be with you more than anybody. You know? And, and, I, and I also understand that for some of you, and I, and I know, and I don't know everybody's story, but I just know in a room this size, there are, there are couples in here that would say, I don't feel like. I want to be with my spouse more than anybody. I don't feel like I want to spend more time with them than anybody. I just don't feel that way. I want to tell you something that maybe you don't know is true. Maybe your marriage is in a place where you kind of feel like it's not that great. There may be some of you that would say, our marriage is awful. But I promise you, no matter where you are in your marriage, it can get better. It can get better. We were... We were not just out of love. We were out of like. We didn't even like each other at one point. We, just, we argued every time we were together, every time we were on the phone. It was just constant. It never ended. In front of our kids, you know, when all of our kids, all the time we were arguing. We just did not even want to be around each other. So I understand how this means. But I want you to think back to a time with your spouse 
when you were dating. Now, for some of you, that was many, 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 many years ago. For some of you, it wasn't that long ago. But think back to when you were dating. Just think about it. What did you do together? You did things that were fun. You, you gave more than you do now. You, you spent time doing stuff that they like to do, maybe as much or more than what you like to do things. Like Donna learning to play golf for me. And maybe you don't do those things anymore. See, that's all, in Revelation, that's all God's talking about. Go back and do the things you did before. You can go back and do the things you did before, maybe in your dating life, and that love can come back. I promise you, no matter where you are, if you're out of love, you can come back into love. You can fall back into love again. I promise you, it is possible. Now, some of you, maybe like us, would say, well, when we started dating, we weren't living a godly life. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying if you were partying and doing, I'm not saying go back to partying and you'll fall back in love. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying do the things that you had in common that you enjoyed being with each other. And that's the thing that will, will get you back in love. Third law is the law of possession. The law of possession. Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be to my disciple. And then he says, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. See, Genesis chapter 2 said that the two become one. The two become one. And that's in a spiritual way, but it's also in a practical way. And listen, and, and we know, we understand this as much as anybody. You have to surrender everything to the ownership of the marriage. Now listen to me. You don't hear anything else, especially you guys that have been married before. Especially for you guys, I think it's even harder. You've been married before. You have to, have to, have to surrender everything to the ownership of the marriage. You have to. Even children. And you're like, wait a minute, Mark. You don't understand. Oh, yes, I do. Some of you may not know this, but Donna and I have both been married before, many years ago. We do understand this very well. Before God got a hold of me, I was very young. I was 19 years old. Got married. Didn't know what I was doing. What 19-year-old does, right? But I didn't know what I was doing. We both had awful marriages. And we won't share all that stuff with you today. It doesn't matter. But you have to surrender everything to Jesus. You have to surrender everything to Him. You can't hold back your finances. You can't hold back your job. You can't hold back your morality. You can't say, I'm this way on Sunday and I'm that way the rest of the week. And when I come back Sunday, I'll be this way again. You have to surrender everything to Him. And in the same way, you have to surrender everything to your marriage. And if you don't, it won't work. I'm just telling you. The word my destroys marriages. It's my truck. It's my children. It's my job, my job, my car. It's my hobby. It's my house. My bank account. Absolutely. When we when Donna and I first got married, we, like anybody else, we were both very independent had not been married for a long time. I had not been married for a very long time. Um, never wanted to get married again. Honestly, I was totally, I had made a vow I will never get married again because it was so painful before. I'll never do this again. I'll never let a woman treat me that way again. You know, I'll never do that. Never, never, never. But when we did get married, we had so many, you know, like independent people, we had separate checking accounts. We had separate insurance policies. We had all these things separately. And we kept those things separately. I had a bank account. Donna had a bank account. And then we got a joint account. And we thought, well, we're doing it right because we had this one joint account, but I still have my account. She still has her account. And we thought we're doing something great. But I'm going to tell you something. When you put God first and you surrender everything to Jesus, when you do, God will straighten out your faulty thinking. And he straightened out our faulty thinking. And we immediately, when we realized how wrong that was, we said, no more my, it's ours. 
Everything is ours. And I promise you, if you're around us at all, you don't ever hear us say my. You'll hear us say our. It's our car. Now, I mean, I'm not, you don't have to be so dogmatic about it that, you know, I don't say that's her car because she drives the car, but we both own the car. You know, that's our house. It's our children. It's, it's, it's our truck. It's, you know, ours. Everything is ours. It's all surrendered to us. And I promise you, that's where the value comes in marriage. And honestly, if you don't think that this is a big issue, try talking to your spouse about it. Try talking to them about it. There's three ways to violate the law of possession. First is dominance, which is disproportionate control. One person controls all the money. I've known many marriages like this, where the husband controlled all the money and the wife didn't know anything that was going on. Now listen, just because I said that doesn't mean there's not as many marriages where the wife controls the finances and the husband doesn't know so much what's going on. I mean, he makes a paycheck, but she's controlling everything. Dominance destroys the law of possession. It destroys marriages. And you may have lived in a, in a life... I just want to do a little poll here, and, and, and this, is, this is not about you guys, but it's about your parents. How many lived in a home where one of your parents was clearly dominant over the other one. Just raise your hand. We won't ask you to share any stories. Okay, many of you, most of you, had a parent who was clearly dominant. And I know people that would say, you know, I have a good friend that said in, in his family, his dad was clearly dominant. He controlled everything, but he, they had a great marriage. It seemed like his wife, you know, his mom was fine with that. You know, and they never, he knew, as far as he knew, they never argued, never had an issue. Your spouse can tolerate a lot. They really can. Donna tolerated a lot with me. And your spouse can tolerate a lot. But at some point, they will break. And when we're talking about priority and possession and all these things, when they break, and you think, I don't have time to spend with them. I don't have money to do this. I don't have the energy to do that. When they break and they say, I'm done, you will spend all your time and all your money and all your effort and all your energy trying to save your marriage. I know you will because we did it. When I said we couldn't, I didn't feel like I had time to spend with Donna. I didn't feel like I could keep her as my priority. And then when she finally drew her boundaries and came to me and said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I said, what does that mean I'm not doing this anymore? She said, I don't know. I'm just not doing this anymore. I knew what it meant. And I decided, and we decided, and she challenged me. She said, we're getting counseling. And so I called the counselor, and we spent time week after week after week in marriage counseling. And so you will spend time, you will prioritize your marriage when it starts to break. You will do that. The third way to violate the law of possession is uh, sorry, the second way is independence. Selfishness. It's just selfishness. Are you willing to do for your spouse rather than yourself? Selfishness. And some of you are just selfish. We like to call it independent, but we're really just selfish. The third way to violate the law of possession is protection. That you must trust your spouse with everything. And if you won't trust your spouse, and, and I can remember this time when, when Donna and I first got married and we had, uh, we were talking to an insurance agent. I'll never forget it. We were talking to a life insurance agent. And we had uh, this conversation about our insurance policies. And we both had separate policies, you know, and, and that, you know, that's valuable to do that. But we were talking about, he was talking to her about the beneficiary. Well, the beneficiary on her account was her dad. And we're married. And so the insurance guy, the, the insurance guy says, well, wait a minute. Who, who would take care of your kids if something happened to you? Well, she said, well, Mark, of course. And, he, and you could just see the wheels going. He said, well, then, if you trust him with your children, why wouldn't you trust him with your money? And she was just like, you're right. My point is, if you won't trust your spouse with everything, why marry them? Why marry them? If you can't trust them with everything you have, 
Why would you marry this person? If you can't trust them with your children, if you can't trust them with your house, if you can't trust them with all of your money, why in the world would you marry this person? Are they not the kind of person that you should trust with everything? And if not, then why are you marrying them? And often we counsel the you know, students and young adults when they're talking about getting married, and, I, and I'm thinking, they won't trust this person with certain things, but yet you're talking about marrying them. Why would you marry this person that you have any apprehension about trusting them? Why? You don't have to. Now, that doesn't mean that the person can't become trustworthy, but listen, especially for you guys that are not married, and, and I should get a lot of amens from the married people. If you think you're going to go into a marriage with this person that is not trustworthy, and you're somehow going to make them into a trustworthy person, it ain't going to happen, right? Amen. Ain't going to happen. That doesn't mean that God can't change them because God changed us after we were married. It can happen, I promise you. But don't go into a marriage thinking, oh, God's going to change them. He might. But you don't get married to them until he changes them. Right? Hello? Can I get some amens on that? Don't marry them until God changes them. I want to say something to men that are, are not really liking me right now because of the law of possession. And I, and I get it. I've been that guy. Do you know what a husband is? Men, do you know what a husband is? Husband is an agricultural term. It's an agricultural term. It actually means grower, cultivator. You are the one, a husbandman. You are the one that takes care of the farm, that makes sure everything grows the way it's supposed to grow, that all the animals are, are taken care of and grow to the point that they're intended to grow. The husband is the loving initiator of the well-being of the home. It is your job, husbands, men, to make sure that your wife, that God grows her and cultivates her, that you keep the weeds out of the way. You know, that you, you keep everything out of the way so that God can grow her into the woman that He made her to be. And that someday you're going to face God and God's going to say to you, I've trusted you with all this stuff. And one of those things is going to be your spouse. And you can go to Him and say, I pushed her down. I made her serve me. I made her subservient to me. I took care of everything and she, she took care of me. Or you can say to God, look God, you gave me this woman and she was awesome, but look what I'm giving back to you. This awesome, amazing, confident woman of God that has served you and, and brought many people to you. Look, God, this is what I have done. And that's where the parable of the talents comes in. That you took something small and you made it into something more. You don't make it, but you help make it happen, husbands. You are the cultivator. You're the, you're the initiator of the well-being of the home. And that's your job. And listen, when, when you realize that, when you suddenly your eyes are open, you will see your wife in a totally different way. I'm going to tell you, your wives are made in the image of God. And they are made with a purpose. And they are made with a plan. God intends, to, and women, some of you, maybe you've never heard this before, but God intends to use you ladies to bring change in our community and in your homes and all around the world. And you have great power. And husbands, all our job is to get the junk out of the way, the weeds out of the way, and make sure that God raises them up the way He wants to. Shared possession creates intimacy and value, and it conquers jealousy. When you say to your spouse, husbands, wives equally, I trust you with everything I have. I trust you with everything we have. There's no more mine. It's ours. That gets rid of any jealousy, any possible jealousy. My phone, look at it anytime you want to. My email, it's wide open to you. I trust you with it. And I understand that's hard. That's hard for a lot of people. And, and even in ministry, you know, um, and I'm just saying this, and I, and I want to close here. David, if, if you guys will come, I don't know what you guys, you just want to come or the group, but um, I, I just want to say this to you. I understand that it's hard. I do. 
But you've got to get to a point that you trust your spouse with everything. And for some of you, right now, that might be really hard to say, I'll just hand you my wallet, I'll hand you my phone, I'll give you my, my email. You can see everything. And it, even in ministry, I have many ladies that will contact me, you know, in and, and, and innocent ways. But this woman will always know it. She will always know it. And if she ever has a problem with it, it won't happen. We don't minister. I don't minister alone. We're partners. We're partners. And if you want to meet with me, ladies, if you want to meet with me, she's probably going to be there. If there's any possible way, she's going to be with me. And if men, if you want to ever meet with her, it goes the same way. I'm going to be with her. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have a conversation. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You, you know I'm not that way. We're not that way. But when you share possession, it creates an intimacy and kills jealousy that could possibly happen. The fourth law is the law of purity. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then it goes on to say, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I love that verse. That tells me that what they ate in those days had no calories whatsoever. <laughs> it was the greatest ever. Because I don't know about y'all. I'm not going to go there. Sometimes I'm a little bit ashamed. But basically what that means is there was an intimacy. An intimacy. Unhindered access. Is there an intimacy in your relationship? Is there unhindered access between you and your spouse? Basically what that means is God designed our differences and sensitivities. He, could, he designed us. And we think about why are men and women so radically different? What was God thinking? But he knew what he was doing. And, and, and listen, even with, our, with our, our genitalia, God made us that way for a reason. And I understand this is hard. And some of you like, Ugh. you know, I get it. But God made us that way for a reason. He wasn't just doing some random crazy thing. There was reasons for it. And when, when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they covered up was their most sensitive parts. And listen, when you, when you have damage in a marriage, marriage, you cover your most sensitive part. Your differences and your sensitivities are what you immediately cover. And when I talked to Donna like she was less than me, and that she was there to serve me, and what, what I did was more important than what she did, she covered herself. When I talked to her like she was less than a human being, and that she wasn't worthy of respect, she wouldn't share with me. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't open up to me. And I, found, and I found out she would talk to people that she trusted, but she didn't trust me because I didn't, I didn't understand this law, that there's a law of purity, that I have to treat her with love and respect. And when you don't, people cover themselves. And, and it goes for men. Listen, men even more. Ladies, you might not realize that, but men are even more sensitive. We really are. We, we don't like to admit it. We put on this macho image, but we really are. You can hurt us with a word more than we can hurt you with a punch. I promise you that's true of every man you know. Your sons, your husbands, your fathers, it, we're all that way. Generally, we're that way. We don't act like it. But when you cut us down, phys uh, when you talk to us in a demeaning way, it hurts us. It cuts us down. And we cover ourselves. We won't share with you. And you, you go to work and you go, I don't know why he won't talk to me. I don't know why he won't open up to me. It's because you've damaged him. And he won't open up to you. And this is what I did to, to Donna. And she was covered up all over. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Does your spouse feel safe? Do they feel safe? And do you take responsibility? And if you don't, they'll never feel safe with you. They might feel safe with someone else. And honestly, I believe this is where affairs start. I really do. I think when your spouse feels safe that they can come to you with anything and you won't shame them or embarrass them or share it in public and you will just understand and love them and try to work through things with them, that's where there's no jealousy, no chance that you will have an affair when you have that kind of relationship. And we didn't. And when, and when we got counseling and God began to heal our marriage and I learned how to treat my wife with respect, she began to feel safer with me. I took responsibility for my own stuff. 
And she began to feel safe and know that she could trust me. And the fig leaves started falling off and she started opening up. And eventually she became naked before me. And she's been naked ever since. <laughs> I'm not looking over there. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> but in an emotional way, that's the way God created us. Unhindered access. Who I am, you know it all, you have it all, it all belongs to you. There's nothing between us. And the relationship with God is the same way. I ask you to stand, and the worship team's going to lead us in, in a time that you can come to the altar. And maybe, maybe you need to come to the altar as a couple. Maybe not. But maybe today's the day that you need to decide, I'm going to put God first. He's going to be my prior, priority from this point forward. Nothing, no hobby, no sport, no job, my spouse, my children, Nothing else, this church, my ministry, nothing is going to come between me and God. He's going to be first. Maybe you need to come to the altar and make that right with Him. Maybe you've got that part right, but you put your children in front of of your spouse. Maybe you need to come to the altar and, and, and repent of that and decide, I'm going to put God first, my spouse next, and then my children. And we're going to talk about all these things over the next few weeks. And I want to encourage you to come back. I want you to encourage you to invite some people, especially some single folks. But this is your time to be with the Lord. We've kind of lost that love that we've had for you and for our spouses. God, that we haven't really made ourselves responsible for the things that we've done. And our spouses don't feel safe. Lord, I pray that today you've begun a conversation with couples that would say, we want to do marriage God's way. And we'll do whatever it takes to do it your way, God. And I know that you'll honor that prayer. And you'll begin to change lives. And and in the marriages that you change, you begin to change families. And when families change, communities change. And when communities change, our world can change. So God, we believe that you instituted the covenant of marriage. and, And God, even though it's been under attack, God, we know that it's still your plan. And so we ask you, God, as this group of people, that you would strengthen our marriage. God, that we don't have to worry about what the rest of the world does, that we would do marriage the way you called us to do it. We don't have to worry about them. Let us do marriage the way you call us to do it, God. And then you'll take care of the rest of those things. And so that's our prayer, Father. We thank you. We bless your name today, Jesus. Continue what you've started in this place, God. Let us go out and be witnesses of your grace and your faithfulness and your hope that we have only in your son Jesus. Let us be bold in our witnessing to those that need to hear how awesome you are because you are indeed an awesome God. And we praise you in this place. And the whole church said amen and amen. God bless you guys. Hug somebody before you get out of here. And we'll see you next week for part two.